factors. But we really, in, as plant pathologists, are typically mostly focusing on these infectious organisms. So why do we actually study plant pathology and why is it such an important thing? I mean, you can imagine that as we have this growing population since 1980, more than 2 billion people have been added to our population. Uh, we are having a really hard time actually feeding our growing population. And we know that we're only gonna continue to have more population growth. And you know, part of the reason that we don't have sufficient food for our growing population is certainly due to a lot of you know, misuse of resources and, and you know, all, all kinds of like socioeconomic problems, but we're certainly having a challenge of, of having arable land and being able to actually retrieve good crop yields. So an estimated 14% of total crop losses are due specifically to plant pathogens. And then of course, we also care about plant pathogens, not just for our, for our food crops, um, but for other, you know, other agricultural uses as well as the environment, right? The environment is a, is a, you know, is a big part of, of plant pathology. And it's not one that we usually, we get to talk about all that much because a lot more funding and, and emphasis goes on agricultural plant pathology. Um, but of course we have forest pathology and there's horticultural pathology issues as well. Basically, we know we need plants to live and breathe. Um, and so just about every plant that you can think of has some, some factors that are influencing their health and oftentimes you know, have specific pathogens that have evolved to, um, to parasitize them. So these plant pathogens historically have caused huge economic and social impact. In the 1800s, the Irish potato famine uh, caused the starvation and death of over a million people and of course caused a huge migration of people from Ireland to the US. Um, and I will point out that that's probably one of the reasons that I'm here today is, is ancestors of mine did come over from Ireland. The Sri Lankan coffee rust epidemic is another epidemic that has actually had significant social impact um, because of the shortage of coffee plants that were being infected by a rust pathogen, which is a fungal pathogen. The, the British now drink tea instead of coffee. And so that's really, that's really changed um, some behavior. And then of course the ecological in, impacts have been devastating. So here on the bottom, we see chestnut blight, which is a, a disease that many of you I'm sure are familiar with. And, and Dr. Connors actually did some really wonderful work in her PhD on this system. And chestnut blight has unfortunately devastated our American forests and completely change the, the makeup of forest trees. Um, and so we, we really have lost, you know, so many, so many plants from all of these pathogens. Um, and we continue to have new epidemics, new, uh, new problems that we're dealing with every day. So the disease triangle is a concept that I want you all to, to just think about for a moment. This actually, it's a, it's a fundamental concept that we talk about in plant pathology, but it actually pertains to to all pathology. Basically, in order for a disease to occur, you have to have environmental factors that make the environment favorable to disease. You have to have a host that is susceptible, and sometimes that susceptibility can be influenced by growth stage. So if you have you know, a, whole, a host that, that's too young or too old, you might be able to sort of miss out on disease. And then of course you have to have the presence of a pathogen, right? Nothing is gonna occur out of thin air, but the, the pathogens are generally around us a lot. Um, so the pathogen influences include fitness and survival, the abundance of the pathogen, the host adaptation, and then the virulence. So there's a lot of sources of, of you know, so factors that influence disease that we can think about. What pathogens specifically actually can cause diseases? Well, as, as we you know, kind of started to touch upon with the disease donut concept, there's fungi. Fungi actually comprise the majority of plant pathogens. And I just threw up a couple of my favorite examples, a leaf spot pathogen. This is, is a Chlorosiboria blue, um, this blue fungus that doesn't really cause plant disease so much as causes problems with, with um, wood decay in the forest. 
and then a nice powdery mildew pathogen. There's also oomycetes, and, that, and oomycetes are actually what I study. These are fungal-like organisms. They really act a lot like fungi, but they're not fungi. They're actually more closely related to plants in the evolutionary timeline. However, they've evolved to become pathogens to different species. Bacteria can also cause significant plant problems. Um, and here I'm, I'm showing a bacterial leaf spot. You can also have bacterial wilt and these unsightly tumorous growths caused by bacteria. This is a, this is a kind of a common one to see um, in garden plants such as uh, euonymus and other rosaceous plants. It's called crown gall. It's a very, very interesting disease and actually it's caused by the bacterium agrobacterium tumefaciens, which if you've taken the biology or biotechnology course, you might be familiar with because of its use now in, in transformation of other hosts. Viruses, uh, just like we're, we're dealing with now with the, the COVID epidemic, viruses can, can cause plant diseases. And viruses are, are you know, are, can cause some really stunningly, uh, I, I want to say beautiful symptoms on plants. We're seeing here these like sort of mosaic-like symptoms, uh, they're very unique looking, but cause significant, significant crop losses and devastation. Nematodes are, are sort of the last group of pathogens. And even though they're, they're not you know, exactly microbial, um, they, they're small parasitic animals or roundworms, and they also can cause some really striking symptoms of disease, including this leaf banding and um, root uh, gall formation, which again, results in, in terrible crop losses. So I study, as Regina said, I study sweet basil. Everyone likes sweet basil, right? I hope so. If you don't, that's okay. But it's generally considered to be the most important cul culinary herb worldwide. And in the US, um, estimates of our yields for basil production are over $300 million annually. And it's sold, of course, as a cut herb, um, as whole plants. You can find them in the supermarkets or at garden centers. Um, of course, basil seed production is a huge, huge factor. And it's even harvested for essential oils and frozen foods and beyond, right? There's, there's so, much, so much use of basil. And it's you know, such a significant plant that has you know, impacted um, many cultures, and especially you know, in Italian cuisine, it's a, it's a very significant, significant plant. So unfortunately, in about 2007, basil downy mildew entered the US. Um, it first was reported in Florida, and it's rapidly spread to nearly every US state since then. Since basil downy mildew became an emerging disease threatening basil, um, significant advances have been made to understand the biology of infection. It was identified to be caused by the pathogen Paranospora belvarii, which is an oomycete or fungal-like organism. And it's an obligate parasite, which means that it requires living plant tissue in order to colonize and to um, reproduce on. Unfortunately, it can cause multiple infections in a single growing season. We know that, that this pathogen requires um, high humidity and you know, a significant amount of dark period in order for the spores to come out and for it to reinfect. And so with that, people have worked really hard on developing controls. Unfortunately, those controls for, the, for this disease in production systems are very limited. Chemical controls um, are not that effective and especially not for organic growers. We don't have good chemical controls for organic basil production. And most people are interested in having their basil um, grown and, and um, produced organically. There's also some environmental controls that can be employed in greenhouse settings, but again, it's really, really challenging and really costly to try to change the temperature and the humidity and the lights in a whole greenhouse. And of course, it's a, a lot harder to do out in the field. How do you know if you have basal downy mildew infection? Well, basal downy mildew um, is characterized by these symptoms of intravenal chlorosis, and this is yellowing between the leaf veins which can typically correspond to 
this um, visible sort of gray fuzzy stuff on the bottom of the leaves. This is why it's called downy mildew is because this the sporulation is really downy on the leaves. And sometimes you won't see this sporulation. It, it does require high humidity in order to sporulate. Um, and if you zoom in under the microscope and actually look at these structures, they're quite elegant and striking. So out of the leaf stomata emerge these antler shaped or the tree kind of like branches. And these are called the sporangiophores. These are spore bearing structures. And at the tip of each one of these little structures is born a dark spore. These spores are aerially disseminated, right? So they blow off in the wind and they blow around to new plants, to new leaves and cause this, these, uh, what's called the polycyclic infection, meaning that as new sporangia, as these new spores emerge, they can keep causing infection. So it can be quite devastating um, for basal production, because once you have a little bit, you're going to have a lot, and, you know, within a week or two. Um, so it's really, really challenging for, for growers and for homeowners <laughs> to, to be able to control this. The way that the downy mildew pathogen, you know, sort of infects the plant is very similar to the spinach downy mildew pathogen, and they have some nice drawings here. So I just wanted to point out that the spores land on the, on the plant surface and they germinate. And once they germinate, they're able to sort of punch through the, the plant tissue and feed in between the cells. So they do this intracellular colonization and they create these, these feeding structures. And you can see here, we, we cleared and stained some leaf tissue and you can see this hyphal branching of this oomycete. And these little little uh, circle shaped structures are the feeding structures. Then as the pathogen continues to proliferate and colonize the plant tissue, it causes that chlorosis. Sometimes it's intravenal. And in this case, I inoculated this plant and it really became chlorotic in most of the leaf. <laughs> um, so it can be you know, very, very virulent at times. Then once you, once you crank up the humidity, you, can, you see this uh, visible sporulation, which is the asexual reproductive cycle. Um, and as we, as we saw here, this is, you know, corresponds with these elegant spore bearing structures. So one thing that has been, uh, I would say really interesting to me um, and exciting but I wouldn't have known that I was excited about this until I really had to start challenging myself to learn more about it, is understanding what's happening, not just at the cellular level, but really at the molecular level between the host and the pathogen. So I would, I would love to know, you can put it in the chat uh, for me to look at later, if you already knew that plants have an immune system, did you know? I didn't until, Going, to, going back to college and, and back to school. So plant defense responses during pathogen attack are very complex. And this figure is, is a, a bit complex itself, but I, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. I'm, I'm gonna tell you that plant immunity and, and plant responses to pathogens really are just this back and forth interaction. So on the left, uh, the y-axis, we have the sort of amplitude of defense represented. And at some point, right, the, the, a pathogen will land on a plant. Sometimes it's just an innocuous uh, bacterium and it's not actually a pathogen, right? But there's all kinds of different receptors that recognize these general pathogen factors and that mount the, the sort of the low level defense response by the host. And so basically this is the plant's way of telling what is not itself, right? Um, either, you know, it's something that's a foreign invader or something that's causing, you know, physical damage, like chewing up the plant material. And, and there's this low level um, defense response that's conserved. Pathogens that have evolved to actually parasitize plants secrete these proteins called effectors, right? So they are affecting the, the plant immune response um, by diverting, you know, by evading recognition, basically. It's, it's sort of 
like a hide and seek game. And pathogens that deploy these effectors are able to subdue that defense response. Well, of course, in this you know, sort of back and forth interaction, plants have evolved receptors, so these receptor proteins that specifically recognize pathogen effectors. And then they're able to mount a very high uh, level of defense. And this is, this is uh, very costly energetically for the plant, which is why there's this initial lower level of defense response. But so basically you have this back and forth interaction where you have plant recognition of the pathogen and then pathogen deployment of new or modified effectors to overcome that recognition and so on and so forth until you eventually have an outcome of either plant disease or plant defense. There are two general kinds of plant resistance to pathogens. And one of them is called, oops, sorry, qualitative or vertical resistance. And this is when you have a single resistance gene that recognizes, recognizes the pathogen effector and it results in sort of the cell death response or this is called HR, hypersensitive response. Um, and it's able to effectively wall off the pathogen and keep it from spreading. The other kind of resistance is quantitative or horizontal resistance. And this is thought to be more durable. It's controlled by many small genes, many genes with small effects um, that add up to a resistant plant. So we have, to, we have to know a little bit about this to go into you know, trying to understand why we would even breed for plant, plants that have this disease resistance. Where my work comes in is that we have collaborated with basil breeders. So there's a team at Rutgers University that has been breeding basil for a very long time. Basil is pretty challenging to breed um, and I'm not a plant breeder myself. Luckily, these people were able to take two cultivars of basil and breed them together and produce new cultivars. The cultivar on the left is called Newton and it's a sort of Genovese type sweet basil cultivar that has a lot of desirable characteristics, phenotypic characteristics. It's got nice, big, fleshy leaves. Um, and it is, it's a lovely color. And it tastes great, and it smells great. The plant on the right is Mirhani. And this plant, you can see, it looks a lot different, right? It's phenotypically very distinct. It has these like kind of ruffled leaf edges. And I'll tell you, it has also a very distinct phenotype, aroma, and flavor. So the aroma and the flavor, right, are, are more similar to sort of like a licorice type of basil. And so this is, you know, it's not something that you can substitute directly for sweet basil, but is something that is, was luckily identified to have some resistance to the pathogen. So from that breeding program, the Rutgers team was able to develop and release four basal cultivars with improved resistance to downy mildew. These are called obsession, devotion, thunderstruck, and passion. And so through multiple rounds of breeding and, and what's called back crossing or breeding of the F1 progeny back to the susceptible parent, they were able to select plants that have this improved resistance, but look a lot more like and taste and smell a lot more like the susceptible parent. So that's great. In addition to the records breeding program, other breeders have produced downy mildew resistant cultivars, including Prospera and Amazel. And these actually share the same source of qualitative or single R gene mediated resistance. So we have you know, the, the four plants here that have quantitative resistance, and then these two plants and, and the offspring um, or the so subsequent lines that have now been bred from Prospera have the single gene mediated resistance. Unfortunately, all of these available cultivars um, can still become infected with downy mildew. And, and in fact, I have multiple samples of the pathogen from each of these cultivars. Uh, so we really still need to identify these specific sources of qualitative and quantitative resistance so that breeders can combine them to produce more durable varieties in the future. All right, I know that's a lot to, to take in. But just to recap, right, we have this qualitative resistance is, is single race specific, single gene, and then quantitative or durable resistance. If we look back at this diagram, we can see that 
you know, this, this durable resistance, even though it's controlled by many genes, it still has this involvement of these plant receptor type of, of proteins, these resistance genes. So further identifying pathog you know, these, these plant genes and then identifying the pathogen effectors that are interacting with these genes will allow us to discover these mechanisms that the pathogen uses to overcome resistance and identify new sources of resistance, which is really exciting. So how do we practically use this genetic information to identify resistance? The central dogma of biology tells us that, that DNA is you know, sort of the blueprint in our cells of all the genes that we have available to us. And RNA is the, the contractor, if you will. So it takes and interprets the blueprint and transcribes the DNA to, the, to RNA, which is then translated into proteins, which have the biochemical activity of, of interacting with each other and, you know, and, and sort of informing all these different phenotypes. So at the DNA level, we know that there are different genes that are involved in plant resistance. Breeders typically do something called a quantitative trait locus analysis to identify sources of quantitative resistance. And all you have to, to know here is that our collaborators previously did this with the, with the basal breeding lines, and they found that there's one major and two minor loci that appear to be controlling this basal downy mildew resistance. So we already had the clue that there are at least you know, a couple of genes, if not more, there could be many genes per locus that are involved in this resistance response. And so my advisor, Li Jun Ma, is a comparative genomicist, but also has a lot of experience doing RNA-based work. So she really hypothesized, and this is where you know, our group comes in, to say that the resistance genes, you know, we wanted to skip ahead to, to not just looking at the, the genome, but saying what genes are actually gonna be transcribed and expressed during pathogen interaction. We hypothesize that these resistance genes involved in the response will be transcribed during pathogen interaction with resistant basal. So in order to identify these genes um, that are involved in the resistance response, as well as candidate pathogen effectors, right, that are, that are interacting, our group partnered with the Rutgers team to design a comparative experiment um, to identify these transcriptionally regulated genes. And so we have the susceptible Newton basil and the resistant Marihani parents. And Dr. Rob Pine of Rutgers University, he was a grad student at the time, and this was the, you know, a lot of his uh, dissertation research that he defended with um, was, was based on all of this breeding work that he had done. So he was able to inoculate these sets of parent plants with the pathogen or with water to mock inoculate them and then collect RNA during the different time points of infection. So over three days, he collected RNA and then he was able to convert that into cDNA, which can then be sequenced, right? So, that, so this is supposed to represent the magic of, of RNA sequencing. Um, basically, it gives you a lot of data. And fortunately for, for us, the Ma lab is, is generally very experienced with computational biology. My, um, my former grad student met, you know, partner in, in crime here, Dr. Greg Delio, he is really a, a brilliant computational scientist. And so he was able to take this data and interpret it. So, so just to, to recap this, we're looking at all of the RNA and we're, we're using that as sort of a clue of like what genes are involved in these different responses of the susceptible plant and the resistant plant um, in response to the pathogen infection. So, in order to sort of like identify candidate genes from the pathogens and the plants, Greg was able to group the, the, the genes based on transcriptional profiles. And then we can kind of visualize this. And this is called cluster analysis. So don't get overwhelmed here. I'm just gonna tell you that the clusters um, are represented on the left in orange the by the resistant plant transcriptional profile, uh, upregulated is, is you know, sort of at the top of the y-axis and downregulated is at the bottom. In the middle, we have pathogen genes and on the right, we have susceptible RNA. So in the left column, we have 
likely pathogen genes that are upregulated in this center gray bar in the pathogen samples. And these are predicted to be involved in membrane metabolism and biosynthetic um, processes. In the middle column, we have genes that are sort of similar, similarly expressed between the cultivars, right? So they have these similar patterns of expression in the resistant and the susceptible cultivars. And expectedly, these are genes that are sort of involved in general functioning and homeostasis of the plants, right? So photosynth photosynthesis, development, and metabolic activities. Then on the right, we have our really exciting, you know, data about what is different between these two cultivars. So at the top, there were no really biological processes predicted um, from the set, but we have genes that are highly upregulated in the resistant plant um, and downregulated in the susceptible plant. And this includes two late light resistance homologs. So these are genes that are very similar in sequence to known resistance genes um, in a different plant. And we also have general defense and stress uh, response genes that are upregulated in the resistant plant. And then we even have clusters that reveal unique genes that are upregulated in the susceptible plants. And these were used um, to actually identify what are called susceptibility genes. Um, so these are specific genes that pathogens can target and you know, cause the, the virulence. So first we're going to, I'm just going to tell you briefly about one of the projects that I'm currently working on. I want to identify the pathogen effectors, right? In this back and forth interaction, we have all these pathogen effectors that we think are interacting with the host plants. Um, so in, basically in, in order to identify these, um, we, can, we can take what we know about pathogen effectors generally and filter out the data. We want to understand the virulence strategies that are employed by this pathogen, and we want to start to understand the diversity of the pathogen populations that are out there, because we know that pathogens um, lose or reshuffle or mutate their effectors in order to evade the resistant host detection. And so this can, these can be like really important clues for understanding what the mechanisms are of you know, susceptibility and resistance. So indeed, we can examine these clusters that have differential regulation um, that are sort of increasing in, in expression in the susceptible plant. And then we can use all of these genes that are, that are predicted to be sort of increasing as the, the pathogen um, invades the, the susceptible plant, and then take what we know about pathogen effectors. Pathogen effectors are generally small proteins, um, and we know that they localize from the pathogen into the plant host. So usually they can be secreted um, in this sort of, these are the infection structures here. They can be secreted from the pathogen into the, the plant apoplastic space between the cells and where they're recognized by surface receptors, or they can be trafficked through exosomal trafficking and actually translocated directly into the plant cells. And so we're, we're most interested in that because that's where these resistance genes that they interact with reside. We know that based for the secretion of the effectors either into the apoplastic or cytoplasmic cellular space, these effector sequences will carry signal peptides, um, which are small peptide sequences um, at their end terminal of the predicted protein, and that directs the secretion out of the pathogen. We also know that sometimes the C-terminal domain of these predicted proteins can carry some biochemical activities, and sometimes those can be recognized and picked up by you know, protein structural and domain predictors. We also think that there's going to be higher levels of polymorphisms and signatures of sort of positive selection on these effectors. So as we start to examine the sequences, we can derive more information. And then we know that cytoplasmic effectors also may have a region following the signal peptide that's involved in translocation inside of the host cells. And for oomycetes and downy mildews, this is called the RXLR. And it literally just means that there's a protein sequence that goes arginine, some other amino acid, leucine, arginine. And so we can use that, that sequence to filter out 
um, the candidate effectors that, that we think are going to be interacting in the, the host cytoplasm. And so indeed, we were able to identify candidate cytoplasmic effectors, um, 11 top candidates from this data set that have increasing expression over time in the susceptible plant. And that's represented um, and in this color scale by what's called fold change. And it's, this is just a, a measurement of expression. So we can see as it turns more red, we know that these pathogen effectors are being upregulated and expressed more. And so that makes sense because the pathogen, the pathogen is colonizing the, the plant tissue, right, and proliferating. And so we know that it's going to be expressing more of these effectors as it continues to spread. So currently, um, we, me and one of my, my undergraduate researcher, um, who's here tonight, and he's fantastic, we're working on screening these predicted effectors and assessing the diversity because we have a fantastic um, collection of pathogen isolates that I've been collecting over the last few years. We want to know if all of these pathogen effectors that we predicted from the original RNA-seq data set are present in all of the pathogen samples. And if so, are the sequences the same or are there different levels of polymorphisms in the sequences? Furthermore, we would like to do some functional validation of these effectors. So we can measure things like, do they actually impact the disease outcome? And that will give us a clue that these are real effector genes encoding these effector proteins. Um, and then we can use those for a lot of different things like um, diagnostic assays and um, identifying new sources of resistance. But that's, that's the, a project that I have less developed. And right now I, I wanna switch and tell you about the, the thing that I've been working on um, tirelessly for, for the last two years. Um, so from the RNA-seq data analysis, we are also interested not just in the pathogen effectors, but in identifying unique resistant plant genes that are involved in that um, quantitative uh, multigenic resistance. And so just like we visually examined the pathogen clusters, we can also visually examine the clusters of genes that are upregulated in the Marihani plant and downregulated or not present in the, in the susceptible plant. And so from this, we can further use what we know about resistance genes to identify potential candidates. The majority of resistance genes in plants, our genes, encode what are called NDLRRs or nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat proteins. And the only thing you have to know about this is that the, the NDLRR genes have a NBS domain, or an N, it's sometimes called an NBARC domain, um, and this leucine rich repeat domain, as well as some sort of N terminal domain that's usually involved in um, direct or indirect pathogen recognition. And so we know that those protein domains are, are generally conserved and that they're involved in direct recognition or indirect recognition of pathogen effectors. And this scheme here just shows that the recognition of these pathogen effectors and factors by these NBLRR proteins, here we have the uh, CC or coiled coil domain uh, with the NBLRR over here. The recognition of these effectors by these coiled coil domains um, causes a conformational change to the protein's shape and activates it to trigger downstream immune responses. And I know that seems like maybe a little bit complex. And I, I'm not much of a biochemist, but it's, it's very interesting. And even more interesting is that plant and animal innate immune responses are actually pretty conserved. They have, here we have animal um, NBLRR type proteins that all have you know, very similar structures, right? They have these similar functional domains as plant NBLRRs. And even more excitingly, the mechanisms of host pathogen interaction in plant and animal, oops, in, oh, sorry, I'm missing a, a thing here. But the mechanisms have been demonstrated to, to be conserved in plants and animals as well. So there's that um, direct or indirect pathogen factor um, or effector recognition causing a conformational change 
sometimes a, a you know a group of proteins will even come together and form some sort of pore and that results in a, a cell death response and that happens in animals and plants and so you know i told you that it was exciting to me that plants had an immune system um, and that's because I just didn't really know that much about immunology at all when I when I started. Um, but it turns out that, you know, the animal, the eukaryotic immune systems, right, are very highly conserved. And in animals, you know, there's an innate immune response, but we also have adaptive immunity, right, in animals. Plants don't have that adaptive immune response. So we, the plants really rely more on these um, these innate immune responses in the presence of these resistance genes. So back to my research. The transcriptomic analysis um, was used to identify top NBLR homologs or candidate genes in the resistant plant. And these were, were predicted based on the presence of these different domains. So we have coiled coil domain, and the arc, and leucine rich repeat. So these, you know, these six candidates here that we're showing have at least one of these functional domains predicted. They also have sequence homology to known R genes in other plants. RPP813 is from Arabidopsis, the model plant, and R1 is a potato gene that, that confers resistance to uh, the late blight pathogen, Phytophthora and Bestans. And we can see that some of these genes have increasing expression over time in the resistant plant. One in particular has all three functional domains and significant upregulation in the resistant plant. And so we, start, we started by focusing on this one to, to start to understand and unravel um, what the resistance genes are. So I was able to do some DNA extraction from the parent plants and then amplify the whole sequence of this gene. And in my PCR screening, I found that this gene is uniquely present, represented here by this band in the Marihani resistant plant. It's not present in the susceptible plant. You don't see a band. And then the negative control confirms that, that this isn't an artifact reaction and that everything worked right. The positive control, I have um, equal amplification at the same position in, in both of the cultivars. And that indicates to us that the, the PCR reaction worked appropriately. And that what I'm seeing here is real. This is a unique gene in the resistant plant. So the next sort of logical um, question that we had about this gene is, is it present in the cultivars that were bred from this cross? When I do the screening, now I have my, my positive control, which is a housekeeping gene on the left, and you can see I have the susceptible Newton resistant Marihani, and then the four um, offspring that were selected as downy mildew resistant, devotion, obsession, passion, and thunderstruck. And I have equal amplification of my housekeeping gene from all of the cultivars. When I look at the resistance gene markers that I, that I designed, I only have amplification from the resistant parent and two of the resistant cultivars. More kind of curiously, these bands are actually different sizes. And so I decided that we, you know, in order to understand this a little bit better, I needed to actually get the whole sequences from these genes and match it up to the transcript sequences that I originally had. And once I did that, I, I did this by taking, you know, isolating these um, specific bands here from the, the three cultivars and cloning them into a vector where I was able to do sequencing um, using a lot of different forward and reverse markers. Now what I've come up with is assembled four unique alleles that are that map to the same gene and they have they all have the coiled coil domain with very slight nucleotide changes between them. They also have an intron sequence, which is not represented in the transcript sequence. The transcript is only the coding sequence, but the intron appears to have some size variation. So in alleles one and two, we have a much longer intron. In allele three and four, a much shorter intron. So overall, the gene is a, is a different size. And that could be why these PCR bands are, look to be a different size. They all have the NB arc domains with, with some 
uh, minor nucleotide differences. And they have the LRR domains, again, with, with minor nucleotide differences. And there are, here in allele two and four, we have the LRR domains match, and one and three, they match. It's a pretty complex um, thing to look at. And, you know, as, as we, as I, you know, kind of was thinking about this, I was like, well, is it normal for plants to have a lot of different alleles of a single gene? And it turns out that if you remember your sort of Mendelian genetics from, you know, bio 101 or, or high school biology, you might have learned about it. Alleles um, are, are two forms of, these, of a gene at the same locus on, you know, a chromosome pair. But sometimes you have an allele maybe that would encode for something like a purple flower versus a white flower. And so you can have two alleles that are the same, um, which would be homologous, or you can have heterozygous alleles. And so if you remember, there are, th there are dominant and recessive alleles, and you know, the different allelic forms and combinations um, are what sort of um, inform the phenotype. The phenotype we're looking for is, is resistance. And what I haven't told you yet is that basal has a tetraploid genome, which means that there are four copies of each chromosome. I know, it gets really complicated here. This is also one of the reasons that basal is so hard to breed. Um, but this concept of having polyploidy um, or you know, multiple copies of chromosomes is pretty common in plants. Um, plants often have whole genome duplications. Um, and as such, this one R gene that I'm looking at having four different allelic variations um, is something that sort of that makes sense that fits in our hypothesis. And you know furthermore, the allelic variations do encode um, very similar proteins, right? They all have the, the same predicted functional domains with very few amino acid differences. So in fact, as I've been reading more about our genes and alleles, <laughs> There's some, been some pretty heavy Google searches in there. It turns out that our gene allelic series are actually fairly common in plants and have already been discovered in other plants and used to breed for pathogen resistant cultivars. So this is exciting and, um, and something, you know, this is very new also that I've, I've just sort of put these sequences together um, in the last week. So currently I'm working to continue to identify and, and sequence and, and build my allelic series um, by cloning these amplicons and sequencing and really trying to make sure that I have the variation characterized as well as the intron locations. Then I can use the, these sequences to create molecular markers for plant breeding. Furthermore, um, I want to design these primers that target the specific sequences and the specific alleles um, so that I can you know, sort of differentially uh, target the, the single alleles, which now have been passed down to the different um, offspring. There, doing that will allow me to provide some functional validation um, of the, the predicted resistance gene. So we, we went through all of this work, right, to do the RNA sequencing and to identify these genes. We want to make sure that we've got the right genes. So we're collaborating with plant genetic engineers who use things like CRISPR to knock genes out or put them in to other things. Um, and so we want to know if we knock out our gene in the resistant plant, do we actually lose resistance? This will allow us to, to provide some validation of the computational predict, prediction and um, further sort of allow us to, to play around with new breeding strategies. It will also allow us to identify the molecular mechanisms involved in quantitative disease resistance. And I think that that's a really exciting um, field that is, you know, very little is known about what the what specifically is involved in quantitative disease resistance. So, I know it's a lot to take in, but I'm just going to summarize my applied and big picture goals. My applied goals really have all stemmed from addressing the real world, real world problem of basal downy mildew. Um, I'm not someone who who has just been you know, enchanted and engaged in, you know, sort of basic scientific questions. I've always been led by 
the need to to address these real world problems um, because of my you know sort of more applied practical background in plants i want to know how do we actually solve these disease problems we'll, we'll do that first by identifying breeding markers so that our breeders can breed new and improved plants faster because that's really the best strategy we have against pathogens is to get resistant plants out there. I'm also working to define these pathogen populations um, for use in like diagnostic assays and new resistant sources. Then the sort of more big picture goal and something that I'm excited to hopefully work on, um, you know, toward in the rest of my career and in the future is to really unravel these mechanisms of quantitative disease resistance and pathogen virulence. And I'm excited about the application of cutting edge technologies to identify these genetic sources and characterize the interactions without the need for like a ton of like genome sequencing, which we just don't have for, for a lot of the, you know, the more um, important agricultural crops. So with that, I wanna just shift gears and wrap up with telling you a little bit about plant pathology careers and training and thinking about um, you know, different STEM, STEM opportunities. So people that have plant pathology training um, often go into science careers, into STEM careers. Um, academia, of course, is a, is a big one. So becoming a professor um, or an extension educator, um, et cetera, is, is a common goal. But we also have a lot of people go into industry. Um, I would say probably the majority of people who, who come out of STEM programs with PhDs go into industry, biotech, and or agriculture. Um, so that is, I think, a, a very um, important um, career opportunity for people to consider. And then of course, there's government work and government research. Um, there's very, very important advances made by the USDA and the US Forest Service. Um, and, in addressing sort of, you know, these real world plant pathogen problems. And then of course I told you there's, there's a lot of overlap between plant immunity and human immunity. So, you know, there's certainly overlap between medical fields and, and plant pathology training and plant science training. And even we have people go into environmental and patent law. So why in the world would you go to grad school? People think that, you know, grad school is you're just you know, going, going to classes and you're working and you're socializing and maybe getting a little sleep. But the reality is, I, I love this meme because you're just, you're doing a little bit of everything, right? And the most important thing is that you go to graduate school to train for the job you want. You learn how to investigate and how to answer, ask and answer questions. You build a skill set and you're exposed to new ideas and fields all the time. And this is really important. It's been especially important for me because I never thought I would want to be, you know, in molecular biology or biochemistry or, you know, doing any of these, you know, immunology. It, it wouldn't have occurred to me before I, I really was faced with having to answer these questions. And then, of course, you make connections. I think that, you know, the faculty, the postdocs, the other graduate students and the undergrads that you work with are going to be some of the most important <laughs> people in your, in your whole career. <laughs> so, that I'm just going to end by giving you my sort of top pieces of advice for grad school and general career planning. One is, I, I didn't know this initially, but graduate degrees in STEM fields can be paid positions, okay? So we, you know, we're not going into debt, taking out more student loans. This is a job. It's not a high paying position, but it is something that you can live off of. College grades and standardized test scores are, have been demonstrated time and time again to not correlate with research success. Okay, and so this is, uh, this is really important. I know that you know, for people who apply to med school, they're constantly studying to get higher, you know, higher grades on the standardized tests. And, and certainly these, these measurements can be filters for, for applications, but in, in, act, in the reality of it, you know, graduate success is not defined at all by your grades and your test scores. You can gain research experience that you need to get into graduate school um, during your undergrad, but you can also do it during the summer. Um, and certainly you can take some time off and do it after graduation. And I think that that's a really um, valuable experience and certainly some of the best grad students 
that I know, you know, in my program are people that have, have gone and worked as, you know, lab technicians um, for a, a few years before applying to grad school. And this is probably my most important piece of advice is to find your mentors now and in the future and make this, you know, people you trust. They don't necessarily have to be exactly who you want to be and, and, you know, model the exact career you want, but they should be people that can give you good advice and can, you know, point you in the right direction. This is by far the most critical factor <laughs> impacting your graduate research success, right? So your advisor is like the number one person that you're going to be interacting with, and they are going to totally inform um, how you go through the program. Also, take the time to become financially literate. This is you know, something that we don't often talk about, but you know, you have to consider the cost of living and the benefits and all of these things. And so you know, look for, for workshops that will help you, you know, gain financial independence um, as early as you can in life. And I mean, that's a general tip, um, but certainly something that you need, um, you need the skills to have to, to succeed in graduate school. And last, but certainly not least, I just wanted to point out that there's no right path to success. You have to try new things and to challenge yourself to see what fits and what doesn't. Um, and just, I would encourage you all to pursue your curiosities and joys, um, especially you know, for the undergrads that are here. There's no telling what kinds of amazing things that you can do. And even if you haven't done them yet, you absolutely will. So I'm very excited for you all to, to you know, pursue your careers in the future. And I hope that you can take um, some nugget of, of entertainment and um, I don't know, joy out of this little presentation that I gave here. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and say thank you so much um, to you all for listening. And I want to, of course, thank my fabulous uh, dissertation committee, Ann Gershenson, my advisor, Lee Jun Ma, um, and other mentors, Rob Wick, Nick Brzee, and Michelle DaCosta, and my lab mates who are so great and have like taught me pretty much everything I know. Um, and of course, our collaborators, our greenhouse support, growers that we work with, our funding agencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so thank you so much. And I will take any and all questions that you have. Let's see what we have in the chat. We've got, a, well, first of all, thank you, Kelly. That was amazing. That was just so much fun and so interesting. Um, I really appreciate it and, I, and I'm, I would bet that the students really appreciate hearing your story at the beginning oh, God. Um, on how, you know, you, you got to where you're going, um, to where you are, and um, that, uh, that it wasn't a linear path. And I think that that's pretty critical for a lot of students to, to hear and to understand that, that um, um, you can zigzag your way to where you, you sure are. Can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay and, and yeah. it can take time and you know um to just, be honest I, I feel like it can be a real strength it can be an asset yeah. to your your career success so i yeah thank you so i'm glad that that that, that came through <laughs> yeah yep definitely oh um, yeah and people didn't know that plants had immunity i was i'm so excited to hopefully blow some minds here tonight yep <laughs> <laughs> yep that's really awesome um, I don't see specific questions. Anybody have a specific question for her? Getting a lot of thank yous um, and uh, that people really enjoyed it. Do you have anything in particular from your sort of previous life of working in the field that, that helps you the most in, in, in your work? I think that that's, so, yeah, that's such a good question. I think that for me, um, I mean, certainly I've, I've over the years, I've become more and more comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? I'm all, I've always been learning new things and pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. And, you know, like it's that I think is a really important part of, of success in science, right? Because you're, there's just too much. You're never going to know everything. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and, and I think it makes you more creative and adaptable to answering questions. I will also point out that having a background where I was like a practitioner of, of plant health, more or less, 
allows me to keep in mind the big picture of how are people actually going to use these things. It's not yeah. just for me to answer cool questions. It's for me to answer questions that, that are going to have direct translational impacts. We have a, um, how do you, how do they breed basil that has distinct flavors like cinnamon basil or mm. lime basil? Yeah. So that, so there's, yeah, there are a lot of cultivars that have very distinct flavors and those are controlled by secondary metabolites. Um, so these are, you know, different essential oils and, and volatiles and things that the plant produces. And there has been a lot of work um, trying to characterize those sort of aromatic profiles. Um, and certainly there, you can do a, a kind of a similar thing where, you know, you, you try, you select um, based on these, you know, in this different breeding. Um, methodology to to choose plants that have that and improved aromatic profile yeah the line the line the citrus basils in particular i think are, are pretty exciting and fun <laughs> yeah those are really fun because some of those secondary metabolites really are present across lots of different plant families absolutely yeah. And so, so you could probably, yeah, so breeding and they have, and Yeah, they have a lot of different roles. There's a researcher here at UMass who is doing research on um, secondary metabolites of plants and, and is actually starting to look at basil in, in regard to pollinator interactions and pollinator attraction, which is, I think, also very, very cool um, field of research. I have a, pri I have a, I have a question here. Um, and is there any research work being done on protein structure with relation to plant pathogen interactions? Absolutely. There is some very cool protein structure research. Um, I, I, I'm not as well versed in proteomics, but the, I just read this very cool paper where they used um, Google's deep fold or alpha fold um, protein structural prediction to to predict new effectors, uh, pathogen effectors that, you know, based on the sort of proposed uh, structural conformation um, that are predicted by this like Google DeepMind machine learning algorithm. Um, and then furthermore, we're, you know, people are trying to identify whether or not they can predict a specific effector NBLRR interaction just based on that structure. So I think that's, a, that's an exciting field of research too. Um, I had another question. Yeah, let's see. Ooh, what were some reasons that made, made you want to quit? And what are those reasons that made you proceed with the, oh, this is a great question. <laughs> um, there are so many reasons to want to quit. Um, it, I, I, I love what I do and I'm very grateful for, you know, having the opportunity to do this work. Um, it's really hard and it's, you know, it's especially hard. I'm, you know, I'm someone that you know, it, I manage um, some mental health challenges as well as, as physical health. I, I have um, a, you know, some, I, I, I consider myself, a, you know, a disabled student. And some days, like, just to be honest, right, some days are really hard. Some days are a lot harder than others. Um, and the, I would say that the reasons that I <laughs> proceeded forward without quitting are just that I'm, very stubborn. I've been doing this for a long time and I am not ready to give up at this point. I've, I've, I've come too far. <laughs> um, yeah. And I definitely, you know, I, I always think about, you know, some, I, I knew that when I started, when I decided to say yes to doing, you know, a PhD and, and really proceeding down that road, I, I was so scared that I was going to just fail. Um, and I mean, and it's not a done deal, right? I still have to finish my research and defend <laughs> my dissertation. So who knows? But I, I knew that I would always regret not trying to do it. Um, so that has, that's been, uh, you know, something that's really kept me going. I don't know if I can speak for everybody, but I can certainly speak for me that it was difficult to finish my PhD also. And, and you definitely have times where you're like, yeah, this yeah. is never going to happen. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I don't know anyone who who hasn't had that experience. Yeah, um, I mean, and especially you think it's gonna you think it's gonna be a straight uphill battle, but it really there's there's uphills, there's plus you know there's like downhill. It's it's all over the place. Um, and so 
one thing that's been exciting for me now, you know, and sort of toward more toward the end of my PhD training is that I'm getting better at stuff, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm starting to learn how to do things, how to answer these questions. And, um, and, and so now my experiments go faster, which is cool. <laughs> All right, are there, do we have any other questions? Oop, I've got one. Does breeding basil or any plant breeding come out mostly successful or unsuccessfully, unsuccessful in terms of immunity? Uh, yeah, great question. So like, just like based on like the odds, I would say mostly, most breeding is unsuccessful, right? You have to do a lot of crosses and a lot of selection to get, you know, I mean, they, they looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of plants and screened thousands of plants to, to select those four cultivars. That's a ton of work and it takes years. Um, so I would say, yeah, mostly, you know, doing plant breeding is very challenging, very time and labor consuming. Um, and so the reason to, you know, try to do this sort of what's called marker assisted breeding or having like specific genes that you target Um, you you really like you can really speed up the whole process if you know that you have specific markers in that that you know plant tissue that you're selecting you can just take a leaf plunge right and do a a DNA extraction a PCR say yes it has the gene or no it doesn't and then throw out all the ones that don't and then just go from the from the yeses I mean that's a very simplified um, way to way to summarize it, but, you know, practically speaking, I think that doing marker assisted breeding really is like the way to go to try to, you know, to try to speed up the process. That's really interesting because I think sometimes people think if you're studying the genetics, it's all about, you know, the gene splicing and putting genes into, but it's not necessarily, it's, it's using it to to direct the breeding, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we could, you know, we could talk at length about the, you know, sort of the ideas of, well, you know, now we can use CRISPR to, to put specific genes into plants and, and yada, yada, yada. But like, it's, it's not, that's not exactly the application that we're going for. We're going to use CRISPR to do some, some confirmation studies. Um, right. But, you know, if you can, and certainly there are people now, like we're finding that we can do use CRISPR and then breed out all of the signatures of, uh, you know, all of the bacterial gene, you know, stuff that's in there and just end up with plants that have plant genes. <laughs> um, and I mean, that's how, that's how breeding works. So why not move forward with it? That's not something I'm, I'm, you know, as well versed in, but it's, it's certainly, I think, an interesting, you know, sort of future uh, discussion. Um, oh, I've got a question uh, from another fabulous plant pathologist here. If you could work with any plant pathogen, what would it be? You know, so this is, I feel like <laughs> this is very dorky of me to say, but I am all about obligate parasites. These are pathogens that we can't grow in culture, um, that we need to, you know, you need to sort of culture on plant material. I love the downy mildews. I love um, powdery mildews and rusts. And if I'm being honest, I think I'd I'd most want to work on the late blight pathogen, Phytophthora infestans. I think it's one of the most interesting pathogens out there. That's the one, that's the potato blight. Yeah. Yeah. It's very similar to to the pathogen I work on currently, but um, it's a it's a bit it's more more well studied and understood. So I think that there's like some you know pretty interesting questions you can ask. Any anything else? Any other questions? If in, if people are thinking about them, um, I'll just I'll just uh, point out to you that. There are some, you know, there's a lot of people who've pioneered the field um, and, and certainly a lot of women that have been pioneering in plant pathology. It's, it's a topic that I always, I, I usually get a lecture on in our intro plant pathology course is, is pioneering women. Um, but I wanted to highlight two women who are currently pioneering the field and that are really inspiring me. Um, in addition to, of course, the, the people that I work with and Dr. Lee Jun Ma, who's a brilliant fungal comparative genomicist. 
Um, there's a woman in um, Georgia, Shavana Smith, who studies molecular genetics of host resistance. And I, you know, she's she's working on on corn and and this Ustilago matus, which is which is a corn spot pathogen. Um, and she was recently interviewed on this podcast called Plantopia Podcast. So she she talks and probably does a better job than me at explaining the you know this sort of like molecular host resistance and effector interactions. Um, it, it was a great listen, and and I you know and that whole podcast series I think is a lot of fun if you want to learn more about plant pathology. And then one of my, you know, one of my huge inspirations um, has been Dr. Lena Quesada at uh, North Carolina State University. And she's a vegetable pathologist and she studies um, several diseases of cucurbit and sweet potatoes. And so just like most, most plant pathologists out there, we do a little bit of everything, right? So she does work on epidemiology, she looks at fungicide resistance, she, she makes diagnostic assays for biosurveillance and looks at host resistance. I mean, you know, it, it, I think that she she's really a model of, of work that I would like to do. Um, and, you know, and she has a, a great group. So if you're, if you like this and you want to apply to grad school, I would definitely look at NC State. Um, there are some really fantastic people there. Um, yeah, so that's, I would say that there's, I mean, so many other, other people, but those two, I just wanted to especially shout out. <laughs> that's awesome. Great. We'll check that podcast out too. That's for this. Yeah. Yeah. The, I can, I can put the link um, in the chat for that. If people would like. Yeah, and I'll send also, that, I can send that out to everybody. Yeah. And um, I'm also going to just put my, this is my email address in case anyone has any follow up questions, um, wants to, you know, that you want to take offline or, or anything. I'm always happy to, to talk more about this <laughs> and grad school stuff in general. I've got, you know, I've got here, here in this, in this audience, I have, you know, mentors and family and friends and, and, you know, it's just been, it's, it's a real, uh, it takes a village for sure, <laughs> or at least for me, it's taken a village to get me through this <laughs> experience. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to, to start to be part of anyone else's village. Someone asked if the recording is going to be available. And so I will make it available. Um, I, of course, even with my note, missed the first couple of minutes as, as always. Um, I, I haven't figured out how to get myself to, to, to do it on time, but, but I got 99% 99.9% of it. So we got all the good stuff. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry about the little clip at the beginning, but um, that's okay. Yeah. It's um, I'll uh, for, for DC folks, I will send it out and it'll be posted on our website and I I'll send it to, to Kelly and, you know, so you. anybody else that, uh, that wants it, I, I'll, you know, I can send it to whoever to whoever wants it. So appreciate that, uh, Kelly, that you let us record it and that you're going to share that recording. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, it's, it's just been a pleasure to to talk to you all here and to get to share this. And thank you for, a lot of applause for hanging there. on <laughs> this whole time. Wow. <laughs> yeah, everybody stayed on. We have just about everybody still here. And a couple of students that, that kind of had to leave sort of apologized and said, I have something I have to, you know, so um, I think everybody enjoyed it and um, I really appreciate your time and um, your enthusiasm and, and all your advice. I'm sure the students appreciated that. Okay. And hopefully we'll get to see you again at, at uh, another, another DC event. Yeah, yeah, awesome. absolutely. All right. So well, thank I you think, all so much. So I think with that, we're going to um, end it and um, we'll say good night and hopefully see you at some other, at some other event soon. Okay. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job, Kelly. Oh, thank you so much. First time I've seen you with makeup on. Yeah. I know it's been a while, I have to say. <laughs> you are beautiful. <laughs> I, I uh, knowing that it was going to be recorded, I'm like, I, I really got to, you know. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing.
What does mom think? Did mom enjoy it? Oh, oh you're muted. You're thank muted, you so mom. much. It was wonderful. Um, Regina, you're a wonderful host. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that thank was really you. great. Kelly, it was a great, great, wonderful job. It was just thank inspirational. Thank you. All. <laughs> you're so you're, <laughs> you're so biased. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was really great because you know I appreciate all the things you said, and the, I'd love for you to come and talk at Simon's Rock where I work because you know it's an inspiration to the students to see somebody, you know, to see somebody who's kind of you know maybe like them, or you see yourself in somebody else, you know, in yes. another person, and. And you know you're appreciative of your mentors, and um, yeah, yeah. And I know you give back generously to other people. So I definitely try. You know, I, I feel like I ask a lot of people. Um, Alicia is still here. Alicia has been my one of my mentors since like 2012, maybe. I don't know. It's been, you know, yeah. it's, and now she. We're. I'm asking. She's meeting with me again to you know to help me. <laughs> I know how generous she's been. She's been so yeah. generous to you. Yeah. Yeah. You helped me a ton, Kelly. Oh my gosh. Stop it. It's all reciprocated. <laughs> Thank you. Alicia was my was my plant pathology PA. So oh nice. Yeah. Well, it, I'm, I'm very she, she interested my... in Dominican college. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know. It sounds like a it sounds I I ju just meeting you two. <laughs> I'm like this must be a very special place. Yeah, definitely look at it. Thank you, Franklin. Are you there? Can you say hi? <laughs> oh, his oh, mic is not working. So, so Franklin was in our summer program. The first, the, oh, the first Franklin. Yeah, that's yeah, great. We, yeah, we did a um a summer high school program, and uh, and oh. he was one of our students. That's oh, he, sh he turned off the mic. Are you there? Are you going to say hello? It may, it might, it might not be working out. So, so he started as a, is he, now is he doing his, his no, bachelor's? No, he's not, he's not a Dominican, but I, I, uh, he kept in contact with me. Oh, and fantastic. so I let him, I let him know, uh, he got very interested in, in plants. Um, yes. and <laughs> he, looked at, he looked at mosses that summer. It was pretty great. Hmm. And another student looked at mosses. It is, it is a deep, fear of mine that someone's going to ask me about moth biology those are very com complicated and not <laughs> anything I know much about <laughs> I see Franklin says that, it, that the mic isn't working yeah oh there it is yeah oh but yeah I'm so happy to see you here Franklin it. I'm so glad you came yeah 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 oh gosh well that, that's exciting yeah yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is this was such a nice, <laughs> a nice opportunity. It, I, I can't. I mean, it's very rarely do graduate students get to give this type of seminar while we're like in the midst of yep. the re of research and like that has. It's just it's made me feel so uh, excited and like confident and you know re reinvigorated about that's my work. so great I'm and there's one more bullet point for your cv there you go. Yeah, yeah. it's an important <laughs> one yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no, I, was so, I was so glad that bernie suggested you and when i met you and we just hit it off it was it yeah. was great so yeah and if there's the plant biology symposium again mm. person yeah between, regina we had to cancel we went one year with kim and junia and then the second year we had to cancel because there was a death of a, a, a colleague's husband had died to cancel. So as soon as you know we can all be back in person, it's only a few hours up the road. Yeah, so, yeah, we, yeah, we can. The symposium is free, um, and we we I don't think we're gonna I don't think it's gonna be every year. I think we're gonna move toward like every other year or something. But yeah, uh, my mom and Alan have been have been. <laughs> I've been to the symposium and went to all the student oh, posters. Really yeah. Yeah. I love the posters and talking to each student. It's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah they, they, all of my colleagues said that the, the toughest questions they got were from, from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yeah. Well, have a great night and I'll, I'll see you. <laughs> I'll see you in May. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay.
Oh, oh yeah, yeah. We'll get together in May. Yeah. Can't wait. Okay. Take, take care. Oh, Thanks so thank much. That was a wonderful evening. Thanks, Regina. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank okay. you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Franklin. I'm sorry you were having trouble with uh with your mic. You have a good evening also. Yeah, and thanks we'll, so much we'll for keep joining in touch. us. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Hi, Franklin. Thanks for coming. I'm going to end this now.